Hello and welcome to another edition of our Dad Stamps video. For today's video I'm going to talk about the stamps of Singapore. I was lucky enough to visit Singapore about six years ago and it is a fabulous place to visit, really really interesting and I had a great time there. And one of the highlights of the visit was the um, Singapore Stamp Museum. It had some great exhibits and a, a lot of stamps from Singapore talking about the history of the postal system there. And I found it fascinating and spent a good half day and could have spent longer there. Sadly though, it no longer exists. The Singapore authorities decided to replace the postal museum with a children's museum, which uh, looks very interesting and, and a great place to take children. However, it's sad that the Postal Museum has disappeared and I can't seem to find out what's happened to any of the postal exhibits. I hope that they have found somewhere for the public to be able to come and see all the stamps that were on exhibit. Singapore joined with Malacca and Penang and formed a crown colony called the Strait Settlements in 1867. And from this time, they used the stamps of the Strait Settlements and it is quite easy to come across straight settlement stamps with a Singapore postmark over them. Now, I'd never considered this until I started researching for this video, but I imagine it'd be quite interesting to collect as many straight settlement stamps as you can with Singapore postmarks on them. They're quite easy to come across, so uh, apart from the expensive ones, I should imagine it's not going to be too difficult, but uh, maybe if anyone out here has tried this, you could let us know whether it's a, a feasible task or not. In 1946, Singapore separated from the Strait Settlements and became a separate Crown Colony. And it then issued a set of stamps with Singapore on them for the first time. These were identical to the King George VI stamps of Strait Settlements. So there wasn't a lot needed to do with the design. As I said, just change the nameplate at the bottom. However, this set comes in two different formats. There's a set of 15 that goes from one cent up to $5 with a perforation of 14. And there's another set you can get, which is a set of 18. And the perforation for that is 17 and a half by 18. Now, even without a perforation gauge, it's quite easy to tell the difference between the two and there is a fair bit of difference between the value of the two as well. The 17 and a half by 18 perforation are generally more valuable than the 14 perforation. But it's an interesting thing to look out for and certainly worth, if you can, getting hold of both sets. In used format, they're not too difficult to get hold of. You're looking at a catalogue value of £30 for the perf 14 and £60 for the perf 17 and a half. Surprisingly, it's some of the lower values that are, are worth more. Uh, and in fact, the $5 per 17 is only catalogued at £1.50. So it's unusual in that respect, but definitely collectible. In mint format, there's a, quite a difference then. The $5 mint is £190 in the per 17 and £110 in the per 14. So to get hold of this set, mint would cost you a fair bit, but certainly used, they're easy to get hold of. As always with these things, it looks nice to have a complete set of similar looking stamps. Uh, Singapore produced the, the Royal Silver Wedding Set and the UPU set, like most of the other Crown Colonies, and also the Queen Elizabeth Coronation. Then in 1955, uh, they produced possibly one of the most recognisable sets of stamps around. Certainly one I remember from my childhood, and one I tried to collect almost completely. In used format, they are very easy to get hold of and have quite a low value. In the lower values, it's all ships in different colours, apart from a 25 set, which depicts an aeroplane, a Douglas DC-4. And then the $1, $2, $5 are slightly different formats with Stanford Raffles statue, the arms of Singapore and the Singapore River. In used format, they're very, very cheap and easy to get hold of. Mint catalogue value is about £130, so not unachievable, but will set you back a little bit more. And recently, they have discovered a couple of variations on the one cent. 
Again, these don't change the value very much, but it's an extra thing to look out for. And similarly, there's a couple of different shades on the 20 cent, the 25 cent. So if you want to get the complete lot, it's still not overly expensive. In 1958, Singapore became self-governing and issued a set of stamps the following year for the new constitution. These feature the Singapore lion. And I guess most people out there have seen the 10 cent purpley color Singapore lion. It's certainly when I had lots of when I was younger and it's almost worthless but it's not until you see the whole set together that you get an appreciation that or at least I get an appreciation that this is quite a nice looking set. When I was in Singapore I certainly enjoyed looking around and the fountain of the merlion was one of my favourite pictures so maybe I have a thing about lions and on stamps. But yes, I find this set quite nice and quite attractive. In 1962, they produced a new set of definitive stamps. And once again, these are nice set of stamps. They are flowers, fish and birds, or, or to be more precise, orchids, fish and birds. And they go from one cent up to five dollars. And once again, it's not a particularly expensive set to buy used. And even mint, it's only catalogued about £55. So one that could be got hold of quite easily. Although there's a couple of stamps in the set. The Orchid for £0.08 cent and £0.12 cent, that seem to be more difficult than the others to get hold of. They are a couple of pounds more valuable, but in, in real terms, they're not expensive at all. But whenever I get this set, those two are always the ones that are missing and it, it's harder to get hold of them. So if you get a load of £0.08 cent and £0.12 cent Orchids, then... Hold on to them. Now, people will be after them. There was a few years between 1963 and 65 when Singapore became part of Malaysia and Malaysia stamps were issued and sold in Singapore. During this time, there were five sets produced by Malaysia. And as I said, these could be bought and used in Singapore. And Singapore didn't produce any of their own stamps. But then 1966, Singapore became an independent nation and the Malaysian stamps then became invalid for use. And similarly, Singapore stamps became invalid for use in Malaysia, which up until that time you could use either in both countries. With independence, of course, new sets were issued and a new definitive set was issued again in 1968. This set shows various images of masks and dances and run from five cents up to a dollar. And then there's another set which has got a one cent and a four cent and then the high values of two dollars, five dollars and ten dollars which illustrate musical instruments. The Stanley Gibbons lists this lot as one complete set but they were actually issued a year apart. And the musical instrument set was issued in 1969. Now they do fill the gaps between the one and four cent, which weren't in the original masks and dances definitives. And then they fill a gap for the high value sets. So whether it was the intention to put this as a complete set or whether Stanley Gibbons has listed them together as a complete set for convenience, I'm not quite sure. But they are distinctly different stamps. And it always puzzled me why they were were listed together and and why they were why they look so different so i do have a, a singapore catalog that lists them as two separate sets but in sandy gibbons it's listed as one complete set within the dances and mask set definitives there's actually two types of perforation used for many of the stamps the generally perf 14 is the cheaper option but there is also a perf 13 which are a lot more valuable. Um, so it's worth checking the perforations on this set to see if you've got the perf 13s. For example, the 10 cent mint, it's worth 20 cents. That's uh, sorry, 20 pence. But the perf 13 is 24 pound. So, you know, there's a big difference. So well worth looking out for. There's lots of nice looking sets around this time produced by Singapore. I particularly like the Osaka Expo set that was issued in 1970. It's only four stamps of various forms of wildlife, 
But they did issue this on a, a mini sheet as well, which looks very nice. And I've not managed to get hold of one of these. Other interesting ones. In 1971, they produced one of a, a satellite Earth station. And the interesting thing about this is there was a 15 cent value and then four 30 cent values. And the 30 cent values actually fitted together to make one big picture. But when you separated them up, they were like a quarter of the, the image of the satellite station. So it's quite an interesting set. And certainly if you can get the four still intact, it's going to be worth a lot more than separately. And they repeated this on a few other sets as well. In 1973, there's a national day where there's a, a 10 cent, 35 cent, 50 cent and 75 cent set. And once again, these four stamps fit together to produce one image. And obviously, if you can get them still attached to each other, they're going to be a lot more desirable than if they're four separate pictures. In 1973, they produced another definitive set, which I think are some of the ugliest stamps I've seen. They are very stylized basic designs of flowers and they just don't work for me they're functional they're smaller than normal stamps as well but not particularly attractive they're not particularly valuable either not particularly expensive to buy so easy to get hold of but maybe that's because they don't look particularly nice aside from these though there's still a lot of really nice stamps that Singapore have produced the flora and fauna of Singapore are open to, to show images of on stamps and they've certainly made the most of this. And there's lots of sets of birds, of butterflies, of flowers throughout the next few decades that are definitely worth looking at and definitely worth collecting if you're a, a thematic collector. One particular set I like in 1980, they had a set of ships and it runs from one cent to $10.00. The one cent to 75 cents are a smaller size stamp and are images of different ships on a plain background. And then the one, two, five and ten dollars are slightly bigger format stamps. Once again, this set doesn't have a huge catalogue value, so they're quite easy to get hold of. And they were actually produced on two different types of paper, on ordinary paper and fluorescent paper. The fluorescent or phosphorized paper are worth quite a lot more than the ordinary paper. But obviously you need ultraviolet lights to work out the difference. And in actual fact, Stanley Gibbons don't list them separately at all. But other catalogues do. So it may be something to look out for. And because they're not listed in Stanley Gibbons, you may be able to pick them up quite cheaply. I have certainly come across some in my time but only recently appreciated the difference in value. So yes, yeah, definitely worth looking out for. A couple of more sets to look out for. In 1985, Singapore produced a set of stamps featuring insects. They were produced in two different prints. The first print was done by the Japanese Government Printing Bureau. And these are the ones which are relatively easy to get hold of. But there was also a second printing done by Lee Marden, and there are distinct differences which are shown on the Stanley Gibbon Specialised Catalogue and it makes a considerable difference to the value. The original printing was a set of 12 which Mint has a catalogue value of £18 so quite easy to get hold of. Nice looking set and well worth collecting. But the Lee Marden set, there was only 8 of the stamps issued by this printer but those eight stamps can fetch up to £190 mint. So if you can get yourself a load of those, and as I said, the Gibbon Specialist Catalogue certainly lists all the differences, it's worth looking out for. And it's not too difficult to spot the difference either. You know, there are distinct differences between the values. So yeah, get yourself a catalogue or find some examples on the internet and look out for the Lee Marden sets. With its close proximity to China and close ties to the Chinese culture, naturally Singapore produced some Lunar New Year stamps. And the first one I can find is in 1996 with the Year of the Rat. And they seem to have been produced every year since then. And these follow a, a similar theme for quite some years. I don't think they're as nice as the Hong Kong New Year stamps, but they are certainly collectible and definitely a theme worth looking out for. 
my visit to Singapore coincided with the celebration for the new year, for the year of the rooster in 2017. And I made a special trip back to the Stamp Museum to buy a limited edition first day covers that were designed by Johnny Lois. And he was there to personally sign the first day covers that I bought. So hopefully they are going to be worth something at some point. And it was nice to meet someone who designed some first day covers and has a strong interest in Singapore philately. Like a lot of nations, as time has gone on, Singapore have produced more and more stamps each year. And it's getting harder and harder to keep up with the amount of stamps that are released. And just to illustrate this, in 2005, they produced a set of stamps for National Day, which were described as the fabric of the nation. And they are a set of 40 different stamps showing designs in needlework by different Singaporeans. It's a nice enough set, but do we really need 40 stamps, all of the same denomination? And they've repeated this idea over several years. So each year there's a particular design where 30 to 40 stamps of the same value have been produced. The only possible reason for this is to make money out of the stamp collector. And it's not something I really like. Although, as I say, the stamp designs on their own are quite attractive and nice to look at. But we're being bombarded, us as stamp collectors are being bombarded with more and more stamps. And it's becoming impossible to keep up with them. So maybe countries should calm it down a little and produce less but nicer quality. And we might be buying more that way. Anyway... Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this little tour of, of Singapore stamps and Singapore history. And we'll see you again in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I hope you found it interesting and enjoyable. Don't forget you can visit my online stores at eBay and Dell Camp under the name of Our Dad Stamps, where I have over 2,000 items for sale. Please join us again in two weeks' time for another edition of Our Dad Stamps podcast.